Awesome. Very prompt. Well, wonderful. Um, welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. And we'll stop uh, screen sharing and actually see some of your faces. Thanks for being here. Uh, happy Tuesday evening. My name is Emma for folks that I don't know, um, but also better known as the, the daughter, the younger uh, Brady Harrison. Um, and he agreed to let me uh, MC this evening. <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, welcome, Dave. Hey. Um, so we will get started with um, some introductions and then dive into the reading. Uh, we'll have some time for Q&A after dad reads. So if you want to hold on to your questions um, throughout the reading, you can do that. And afterwards, um, I'll be fielding questions from the chat or if you want to like raise a hand virtually or on your camera to get my attention and we'll hear some questions um, that he can answer. Um, so welcome. Thank you all for being here. Like I said, I will turn it over now to a couple folks to make some brief introductions for the evening. Uh, Steve Davenport, a longtime friend, uh, colleague, and, and student that studied with my dad a million and one years ago at the University of Illinois, will say something that I hope is at least mildly appropriate for a, a diverse and <laughs> far field audience. Um, and then Ted uh, Morrissey, who I feel confident will say entirely appropriate things, uh, who is the, uh, I think, the founder and the, the person behind the 12 Winters Press that published this book of dads and, um, and another uh, novella, um, and a variety of other incredible works that he'll kind of flag for you guys. Um, so I'll turn it over now to Steve, and then Steve can say hey to Ted, and we'll hear their kind of opening remarks. Cheers. Greetings. Brady, we'll have fun. <laughs> Let me start by reading one of the blurbs that didn't make the back of the cover of the book. We're here to celebrate. The author of this censored blurb, a character in one of Brady's tales, is named Mackie. 93 people die in these 12 stories. Hell, I die in one of them myself. You probably do too. To be fair, the author kills himself in one and keeps on talking. There's a weird hockey guy as thick as he is short and a burbling body sticking out of a windshield for days, more sausage, then harpoon or hockey stick and a few soldiers in one story kill as many. Uh, let's just say there will be no prisoners. I don't know if this one guy died after crashing his semi, but I did like the folks who tried to help him got to have a deck building party afterwards with the lumber that was spilled in the crash. I liked that the neighbors pitched in and everyone drank bad Canadian whiskey and some cold beers and shared grilled food. And for the first time in like ever, they talked to each other and one woman didn't have any teeth. And my favorite part was this one guy's cream soda. I mean, he was a simple but good guy who didn't seem all that smart. And it broke my heart that he was drinking that cream soda just as the fucking Mounties showed up to no doubt, no doubt looking for him so they could kill him. That would be 94 bodies. I hope I miscounted because I like the idea of 99 bodies like that one song about 99 bottles of beer uh, and you take one down or that other one about 99 problems and a bitch ain't one. Some of the stories in Brady Harrison's The Term Between are pretty straightforward, like a bullet in your brain pad. Some are tricky, the storyteller telling a story in such a way you can't stop reading because on the one hand are the story details, no doubt about someone getting shoved off a cliff by his BFFs, and on the other, are the ways in which he's telling the story. Machine gun, juggler this guy, smart and tricky, but also deadly. His stories are killers and he's a killer. I know because these stories kill me and he killed me. He'll kill you too. Now that was Mackie, this is me. Let's be clear, Brady created Mackie so he could kill him. Simple as that. The real origin story, once upon a time back in grad school, Brady and Mackie or I played catch. Has he told you he's Canadian and plays hockey? And each time the ball hit his glove, ouch, said Mr. Hockey. Ouch, my hand, don't throw so hard. This summer will mark the 25th anniversary of the trip Rick Canning and I made to Missoula, where we three musketeers got together for a few days, formed a club called Buffalo Jump Collective, drank too much, told the perfect number of stories, some of them more than once, 
and shared our desire to write things outside the house of PhD. Fiction, poems, fantasy tales of throwing a buddy off a cliff because he didn't have his hockey gear on. Lift your glasses, I'll lift mine. Here's to all of that, to talent and execution, and to tomorrow, March 4th, the Canadian killer, Brady's birthday. Happy birthday, Brady. Cheers. And I am now self-muted. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, and, and Steve stole my punchline. Dad's birthday is actually March 2nd, which is tomorrow. Uh, but we will embarrassingly sing happy birthday all off mute painfully on Zoom towards the end of the evening. So if you don't sing, flee shortly after the end of Q&A, but not quite before we say goodbye. Um, but otherwise, yes, it is almost Dad's, uh, Dad's birthday. We won't say how old. Ted, do you want to share some remarks about 12 Winters in the book? Well, I hate to follow Steve's uh, inspirational, I guess that's one word for it, introduction. Yeah, this is the, the book we're here to celebrate, um, The Term Between. I'm Ted Morrissey, and uh, I uh, founded 12 Winters Press in 2012 to publish great books, and this is one of them. And so I'm very pleased and proud to have this book out in the world. Um, we, we didn't do things quite as, as we normally would do them in the publishing world. This is, everything's kind of weird the last couple of years. Uh, and what I mean by that is we got the paperback version out, you know, a few weeks ago. And just today, the beautiful cloth version has become available. You know, normally the, the hardback comes out first and then the, then the paperback, but, but uh, we did it the opposite way, but that's all right. So um, during the uh, reading, I'll uh, send the link through the chat uh, where you can find uh, links to uh, to Brady's book, both the paperback and the hardcover now, as well as a book or several books by this guy named Grant Tracy, who you see on the screen there as well. But I uh, just am uh, very pleased to uh, to be uh, Brady's publisher, and I'm really looking forward to hearing him read tonight. Um, I've known Brady for years, but only two dimensionally until last week. We got together in Albuquerque for several days to promote the book, and uh, that was a lot of fun. So uh, without further ado, I shall turn it back over to Emma or to Brady, as the case may be. I think no more introductions needed. I will, I will give you the floor, Pops. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, so I want to uh, thank first uh, Ted for publishing uh, the book and thank Emma uh, for hosting tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. The book is not nearly so violent as Steve suggests, uh, <laughs> I, I hope. Um, but uh, mostly and most importantly, I want to thank all of you. I mean, it's so it's so delightful to see all, all these old friends. And I, I know you're all um, busy. So I really appreciate the, the time and uh, the goodwill. Uh, yeah, it's just it's such a pleasure to see you all. I'm, I'm delighted. So uh, what I thought I would do um, is read one very short story and then read a couple of excerpts from the novella that ends the collection. Uh, the novella is the, the work I, I would say of the most uh, complexity uh, in the book. And so I wanna uh, read a couple parts of that. The, one, the story I'll begin with, the microfiction is called Buffalo Jump Brother. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's not fiction at all. It's a perfectly true story. Uh, and it's, um, Steve has already made it famous uh, for us. So, I, so I'm actually going to read it and you can hear it. Um, the true story, the true version. Buffalo Jump Brother. Sometimes when a buddy asks a favor, you agree whether you want to or not. One day your buddy, call him Mackie, says to you and another buddy, if it ever looks like it's going to happen again, I want you to kill me. You look at Arlo, he's wiry, wary, his bullshit detector running hot, the leader, and he nods. You know why Mackie asks what he asks, and, all that, and after all that spite and ugliness, you know he means it. Mackie had said it. I had to marry her so I could divorce her. A few years later, Arlo brings Mackie to Montana to see you. The old buddies getting together, the Buffalo Jump Collective, catching up, sipping whiskey, telling lies, cutting up, talking music, guitars, cigarettes. 
But Arlo knows, and you know, and Mackie's got to know, that the trip west isn't just for fun, for old times, because yes, he's done it again. And you and Arlo owe him. You made your promise. And Arlo's at the fridge at 6 a.m., sipping a moose drool. Cracks one for you. And a half hour later, the three of you leave for Glacier, going to the sun. And you pull over, and everybody knows how it has to be. Arlo says, call it a hike. And Mackie, looking at the clouds, says, he's always liked Montana. Says it's not like Gasoline Lake, that's for sure. His hometown in the Illinois bottoms along the Mississippi. Oil refineries, super fun sites, depopulating towns, Church of Christ and biker bars, streams with names everybody knows, but that don't appear on maps. Later, the rangers will say, where did he come from? From a plane? Christ, how far did this guy fall? Or maybe he's falling still, your brother, your buffalo jump brother. So that's a true story. Took Steve up the hill and we threw him off. But there he is. So it all turned out perfectly. So I want to read from the novella that closes out the collection. And it's called The Dying Albertan. And the situation is that a young, a young freelance writer has been hired by a newspaper to interview a Canadian artist. He's a painter and a sculptor, but he's also a terrible fabulist. He doesn't like the press. He doesn't like the media. doesn't like anybody asking him questions about his personal life. But she's been hired to interview him on the 25th anniversary of this very famous sculpture that he's done. And the sculpture goes by a variety of different names, like he won't even settle on what the name of this piece is called. But it's most famously or most widely known in the, in the world of the, the story as the dying Albertan. And so she lives in Toronto, so that's a shout out to Grant. And she flies to Vancouver to his studio to interview this artist whose last name is O'Keefe. And she meets him at his studio and she expects this to go rather badly. And the night before she actually meets with him, she goes to the gallery where the, the sculpture is on display and she takes some photographs of it and mulls over what it is she's seeing. Uh, so I'm gonna read when she finally sits down after she's seen the, the sculpture up close and personal, she sits down with him and we get to hear what this piece looks like. Uh, and so this one other, uh, uh, comment before I read. The novella is divided into two parts. The first part is the meeting with O'Keeven and its kind of fallout and the story he tells about the sculpture. Uh, the second part, I won't say what's going on in it, but what interests me in this novella is the relationship between the two parts and how they might or might not go together. So she's sitting down, our, 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 our freelance writer, a woman named Ritu, sits down and O'Keefe says to her when they when they're had a chance to chat, he finally brings it around to the, to the moment to talk about the work. And he says, you went over to the gallery? I nodded and activated the recorder. What did you think? What did I think? I had spent several hours the previous evening under the watchful eye of an unfriendly demi curator setting up and photographing the dying Albertan from any number of perspectives, high and low, near and far, in between, fixing details and close-ups, retreating to put the details in context, moving the lights and reflectors, creating different intensities and contrasts, trying out the best angles and distances to capture the overwhelming, difficult to look at, anguish in the twisted, destroyed body, front and back, and in particular, it's puzzling, dramatic, yet almost serene, beatific face. As the title suggests, O'Keefe modeled the perhaps one and a half times life-size nude on the dying Gaul, the famous second century AD Roman copy in marble of a lost third century BC Hellenistic original thought to have been cast in bronze. O'Keefe seems to have been attracted to the provenance of the form and the ironies attended to a copy of a lost original that had itself over time become the subject of many more copies and variations. And like the Gaul 
The Albertan sits on the ground in collapse, his weight forward on his right buttock and bent right leg, torso twisted, right arm reaching down to the ground, sharing the weight in agony. But also like the, like the Gaul, O'Keevan's dying man, with its somewhat native, perhaps Asian facial features, has spiky hair, but in the place of the torque, he wears a chain with a cross. The similarities do not end there, but the differences matter more. Where the original has his left hand on his right knee to help support him, the left arm of the Albertan has been completely severed just below the shoulder and lies across his lap. Strangely, while the right arm, like the Gauls, appears lean and well-muscled, the severed limb, I know, I measure, is too big, too long, as if it doesn't quite belong to the body. More, although the humerus, radius, and ulna have been cruelly broken and smashed in several places, the intense, thick muscles seem to ripple as if still firing. Stranger still, the left hand outsizes its counterpart, the fingers meaty and twisting, the palm thick and padded, the implement of a small giant. Similarly, while the Gaul's left leg retains its shape, strength, and poise, the Albertan's left femur, though still attached, has been snapped a small distance below the hip, and the many times shattered zigzagging leg has collapsed on top of the right. Where the Gaul has been stabbed with a sword or spear through the right side of his chest, just below the clearly defined pectoral, the Albertan's left side has been smashed in, as if struck by something massive, furious, and malignant. Ribs like knives jut through the shedded, shredded skin, the rib cage otherwise collapsed, the muscles, soft tissue, and guts also stove in, and the right side bulges as if the insides have been violently and permanently driven sideways. The genitals, like the severed arm, are also oversized as if not belonging to the body. The baseball head size of the penis and long shaft ref, rest on the right thigh. Yet stranger and stranger, the closer one looks, <clears throat> the more ir irregularities one sees throughout the body. At first glance, only the arm and genitals seem not to belong, seem out of place. But upon closer inspection, some of the toes appear undersized. The right side of the jaw, a little distended, the smashed kneecap too large and knobby, the unsmashed hip too protrusive, the buttock, raised partly off the ground, too thin, too bony, smaller than the other. Plainly, these distortions preceded whatever catastrophe befell the Albertan and drove him brutally to ground. Alive and well standing, the Alberta, Albertan would have been an, odd, an oddity, a bizarre, already misshapen figure. Then there's the face. The gall in mortal pain knows he's dying. His body retains its defiant strength in the moment frozen forever in bronze and then stone, but he knows the spear has pierced his lungs and heart and he's doomed. His eyes are wide, he grimaces, his brow heavy, miserable, wishing he could undo his defeat, his death. The Albertan, despite the fact that every detail of his face seems slightly off, the eyes are not level, one appears to be en route to the base of its brow, the nose almost Roman in its lines and narrowness lies, crook, lies slightly crooked, as if aligned toward the left corner of his chin rather than the dimple. It also seems to have slipped just barely down into the lip. A crazy tooth, just one, almost protrudes from the open mouth. The pupil of one eye is a pinprick. The other appears to have no pupil at all. The left ear appears to be creeping its way just toward the back of the skull. The right appears to have slipped just toward the jawline. The nostrils are not the same size. The cheeks do not quite match. Where everything else about the body suggests a shattered vibrancy, the lips seem plastic, not quite right, as if taken from a giant Mr. Potato Head and reworked and adjusted to fit, almost. So it all seems almost serene, almost at peace despite death closing in, despite the force of whatever had destroyed his entire left side. At a glance, one perhaps feels slightly unsettled about the face. You have to look to consider, to notice the sum incongruity of the parts. But the longer one looks, the more one sees until unease becomes alarm or even fear. No doubt about it, O'Keevan was really good, really, really good. Yet why the sense of serenity? Endorphins, some secret knowledge, a visitation that we cannot see, 
A sought for peace unexpectedly arrived. A sought for peace pursued, found, called into being by the Albertan himself. What? Of course, people began to notice these things very quickly once the statue had been unveiled. And all of it had been the source of considerable curiosity, speculation, scorn, debate, analysis, and more. What do I think? He nodded. To say it's overwhelming, which is how I felt when I was studying it, photographing it, trying to see it and bring it into focus in the lens and in my mind, would be to say nothing. O'Keeva knew it was overwhelming. It must have been overwhelming to him unless it was some sort of joke that only he knew the punchline to. To say it's brutal, sad, strange, bizarre, upsetting, bewildering, cruel, vicious even, frustrating, maddening, elusive, powerful, moving. It made me shudder, made me cry, made me long to be cast back a moment before whatever happens happened, to intervene, intercede, to change the course of what was about to ruin this young man made me want to turn away, close my eyes. All of that, known, expected perhaps, old, tired, obvious, would be to say nothing. I sat still trying to process as I had been processing all night, barely able to sleep, both upset and needing something smart to say. I think you must have loved him, whoever he was, and hated him very certainly, very clearly, very viscerally hated him. And something else, his face, it has the ghost of you, even though it's clearly not you. And the nose, it's too small. It belongs to a woman, maybe also the cheekbones. I looked at him as he sat back in his chair, his eyes fixed on mine. I think it tells a story, but no one can read it except for you. And so that section ends and the next section begins with the line, he kicked me out. <laughs> so, so that ends that ends the interview. How am I doing on time, Em? You're good. Sorry, I was just enjoying the reading. Um, I think you have like 10 more minutes to read. 10 more minutes. I won't take that long. Okay. okay. So so thank you all for hanging in there. I, I know it's dinner time or bedtime, depending where you are in, in Halifax. So I'll just read uh, just a couple of pages from part two, because language-wise, it's my favorite part. Of, of the novella. Uh, and again, I won't say how these parts are connected. They may not be. So this is the beginning of part two. At night, sometimes in the small hours, she would sing softly, songs without words, low moans made into melodies. And when she began to sing, he would awaken instantly hearing her both inside his head and in the air above the bed, feeling the vibrations of her voice, not voice, in the bones of his skull and down his jaw and into his neck and chest. The vibrato soft, the breaths, not breaths, shallow, for how could she breathe? Yet a mezzo so clear, so collinginous, so anguished, a vibration, a lamentation, felt as much as heard. And he would pretend to sleep, would try to quiet his heart, which thumped and jumped in his chest like an engine trying to break its mounts. His heart, her heart, would try to keep his own breaths shallow and steady so she wouldn't know he was awake, though of course she knew not knew that he was awake, for she must know, mustn't she? For who could say otherwise, not he, even as he was unsure of how much he knew of her, if any of her thoughts, not thoughts, were his thoughts, or his thoughts, her thoughts, not thoughts. And he would try to move, try not to move, try not to stir, hoping she would sleep, not sleep once more her songs ebbing and flowing and ebbing away at last after hours of singing her songs, not songs, into a noiseless, mournful gasp, not gasp, and then into silence, not silence. For even if her aeration ceased, he could still hear and feel them in his chest and in the bones of his skull and in the night air. And he was afraid that the faint melody would give way to the sudden terrifying gnashing of teeth, the rasping, grating, grinding, clenching, unclenching of teeth. For what else did she have save her voice, not voice, her breaths, not breaths. But her teeth, teeth and gums, and not quite lips, 
little else save the gnashing, gritting, clamping of teeth for minutes at a time. Seemingly furious, frantic, for reasons not reasons until she subsided at last into sleep not sleep and he could breathe again. His heart, chest, shoulders, mind beginning to unclench and if never quite unclenched, at least quieting, yet always watchful, jumpy, jittery until he could exhale. The tension loosening as if unwinding knots from a wire, co a wire coiled and tangled in his chest and back and spine. And if he were lucky, a few hours of half sleep. Or else she might not sing, might not smash her jutting crooked intertwining teeth, the strangely perfect O of her mouth, a circle of crooked spiky teeth, but rather move her lips, the thin line scar tissue of her lips, as if trying to shape words, as if trying to have her say at last, then his scalp twitching and pulling this way, then that. And he trying to judge the shape of the words, trying from the twitching and pulling of his scalp to understand, even as he did not want to know, to understand what she wanted to say, perhaps most wanted to say. To whom? To him? For whom else could she know? As she murmured voicelessly to the icy air, the walls of the old trailer thin and poorly insulated, the gaps around the windows that his uncle cocked and recocked little effect as the trailer torqued, as the seasons changed, as the sun was near and fiery or far to the south and silvery, admitting the damp and cold. And when the wind blew hard or storms came from the north, a keening of snow and sting needles of ice, or when the sun hung heavy and languid and unmoving in the stifling, still superheated air of dead summer, dust from the road and poplar down turned brown and brittle from the sun and the languid pong taste of marsh peat and sulfur and tar from the heating and sun heated oil tanks across the river. Okay, I'll stop there. But the end, that last bit is set in the at the Baskin tar sands and it my hope is that that image of the tar sands dominates the last part of the book. Yeah. So there you have it. Stories from the turn between. Thank you, Papa, for reading. We will um, take a little bit here for some questions or discussion as folks feel interested. People are welcome to uh, type out questions in the chat or raise your virtual Zoom hand or just wave at me um, and I'll kind of acknowledge folks in turn for some questions or reactions. It's so delightful. I'm seeing Scotty, I'm seeing Larry. Wow. Yeah. Great to see you all. So we should all unmute. I think we'll um we'll kind of like let folks speak in turn if there are things that questions that people want to uplift or, or or feedback to share. A question from Ken there in the comments. Wonderful. Ah wow. Uh, yeah, I can read. Uh, um, Ken's comment, John Updike said writing criticism was hugging the shore. Did writing these stories feel like riding the wind and breaking free? Wow. <laughs> well, Ken, thank you. Um, yeah, Ken's a, Ken's a fellow Missoulian and a terrific writer, historian. Uh, yeah, you know, I, in a way, writing these stories uh, feels definitely like a side hustle. Like I, I keep waiting for the bosses at work to say, you can't do that. You, know, you, you have this job you do. But, but my, my real inspiration for writing the stories besides uh, hanging out with uh, Rick and Steve uh, all these years and, and um, hoping that I could sometime get a chance to try writing some stories is that a lot, a lot of folks don't know this, but the great Leslie Fiedler uh, the great wild man of American letters. He actually taught at the University of Montana. It wasn't called the University of Montana in those days. It was called Montana State. But he wrote his great works, his most famous works. Leslie Feeder, he wrote them in the same hall <laughs> that my office sits in, the same hallways. And so if you know Fiedler's work, 
uh, Love and Death in the American Novel, come back to the raft again, Huck Honey. He also wrote fiction. And he, he said that he didn't see, that Leslie Fiedler said he didn't see any difference between writing about stories and writing stories. And when I read that, I found that really uh, liberating. And so unlike Updike, uh, who, who's, you know, uh, Ken's pointing out, demarcates those separate enterprises um, uh, and seems to imply a certain amount of courage in them. I see them because of that inspiration from Fiedler as um, uh, it's the same kind of activity. It's, it's the life of the mind. It's the pleasure of telling and, and, and thinking about stories. So, yeah, I mean, it's been a fun side hustle. Uh, and yeah, I'm delighted to, to see the book. Yeah, and I see Scotty's making fun of me for saying a boot. Uh, no, no amount of years, no, no amount of years in the U.S. has uh, ironed out that vowel sound. Yeah, I'm always betraying myself. Yeah. So uh, when I was writing this book, I was working on several different critical projects and would hop back and forth between them. And um, yeah, I, I found them. I, the pleasures are the pleasures of, are different, but um, uh, I certainly enjoy them both. And so far, the bosses haven't threatened to fire me for for the side hustle hey brady i was wondering if i could interject um in your you uh one of the ways the paperback is different from the hardcover is because there's an afterword in the paperback i know you know that brady i was just telling everyone else uh, but in the afterword you you talk a lot about um your connection to nature and to the land and how that kind of affects your your, your art, I guess, would be one way of saying it. Would you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ted. Yeah, so Ted, Ted was kind enough to invite me uh, to write an afterward, uh, especially for uh, the paperback. And I molded over and I looked at a lot of examples. Uh, Grant's, uh, Grant's noir fictions, uh, uh, he has a, a playlist, music playlist to accompany uh, the action you know, the, the, the two-fisted action, uh, the gunplay, um, jazz uh, list. And so I was thinking about what I might do. And, and I got to thinking about where it is I, where I dream up stories, where, where I am uh, or where I like to spend my time. And I found that I have this uh, uh, compulsion to hike or to cross country ski, to get out in nature, get out in the mountains. Um, my our friend, my friend Sarah, uh, is another uh, great hiker. Always so glad to see her pictures, uh, pictures of her, her pictures of her adventures. So I got to thinking about this afterward, and what I realized in thinking about it was that I dream up the stories uh, when I'm on the trail, and so very often they seem seem to occur to me when I'm hiking uphill. So like sort of in the most physical pain, uh, you know, lungs just pounding, heart, uh, heart pounding, lungs, lungs rasping. And, but I, I noticed that I kind of disappear. Like I kind of get wound up in the, but it has something to do with being out in that environment with that sense of freedom, uh, that sense of the heart and mind going, that sense of, uh, the wind in the trees, the pines, the rivers, you know, the creeks roaring nearby, all of that somehow is inspiration or at least a clear mind space for me. And so, yeah, so not only do I, do I just want to get out there and I don't feel well if I don't go out two or three times a week to the mountains, go skiing, go snowshoeing, go hiking, but also come back with ideas for stories or for articles or yeah, so somehow, somehow all of this is intertwined with the ability to get out, um, or I think it does, <laughs> but that's my story. Yeah. I'm going to jump ahead in the questions queue here. I'm tracking in the chat, but Jean asked um, if you have a way that you record ideas as you hike, like do you carry a notebook or how do they make it home? Yeah, no, they just lock them in my brain. <laughs> yeah, because I don't like to stop. One of, one of the One of the rules... Uh, I don't know if my hiking buddy Joel's out there. Um, one, one of my rules, certainly when I'm when I'm out hiking on my own, is when I'm going doing the uphill parts, don't stop. Like it doesn't matter if it takes 
you know, if it's, if it's going to be an hour, hour and a half, there's no taking breaks. Like that's, that's my kind of rule. Uh, Joel and I will stop and cut up for a bit, but uh, uh, so I don't take a notebook, but yeah, somehow it somehow that sticks with me. I think, I think a wise person would take a notebook um, for fear of losing something. Although one of the points I make uh, in, in, in the, and the afterward is that not every idea is a good idea. <laughs> not, not every not every idea is a keeper. So, some of them are just bad. And I see um, Joel. I think through Julie sent a thumbs up. So I think the McLennans are are listening and and hearing your discussion of hiking. Um, a question from Steve in the chat: Would you talk about the novel you wrote and shelved? In what way did that work inform the novella? Say. Okay, thank you. Yes, Steve, that's, um, yeah, so this is maybe secret. This is the kind of thing you shouldn't talk about in public, but I wrote a novel uh, now several years ago. And what I wanted to write was as wild a novel. I, I wanted to, to write this crazy book. And in, in this novel, it's set in North Africa, in Morocco, in uh, 1930. And it's, it's, based loosely on an actual story, a French, a French poet explorer is trying to find this lost city, this ancient abandoned city that had been inhabited by the Moors in the, the region of the world. The one place the world is not a country, it's south of Morocco, it's an undeclared region. And so I, I wrote this novel and the characters, they're constantly changing shape, they're changing, it seems like they very likely they're changing genders. Um, one of the characters goes on, one of the, sub, the secondary characters goes on uh, part of the adventure with this Frenchman, but he doesn't have eyes and yet he gets around. Um, yeah, I wrote this, this wild, I wanted to write something really unrestrained. Uh, and I shouldn't have done that because um, that's a really hard book to get published. No, no, like, so he, he why would a, an American, a Canadian American, be writing about a Frenchman in North Africa in 1930? And part of the book's written in French. Like I, I basically wrote something that was just madness. And so I learned a valuable lesson that uh, if you want to actually get um, published a bit, <laughs> yeah, and Ted is bringing out that novel because Ted likes crazy things. Um, what I learned from the reaction to that book when I first started shopping it around was that I had to impose some restraint on myself. I couldn't be as mad as I wanted to be. And so the no novella, that's a long answer perhaps, but the, the novella was meant to be an exercise where I could be almost as wild as I wanted to be while I was also trying to write a fiction that was accessible. And so a lot of the other stories in the collection in the term between, uh, I had Joyce Carol Oates in mind. Like I wanted to write a Joyce Carol Oates story. I wanted, I wanted to write something that people could really, you know, dive into and have access to. And so I wanted to, in the novella, I wanted to set that sort of Joyce Carol Oates accessibility in tension with my own inclination, which is to write really far out there stuff. And the novella, I hope, charts a kind of middle ground. And so, yeah, it puts a lot of pressure on the reader if the reader's willing to dive into the novella, but not nearly as much pressure uh, as the madness of the, the, <laughs> the French. I mean, there's things, there's a, um, in the French, the French book, there's a, a chain from a, a giant ship, like the kind of chain that would hold an anchor. And at the end of the chain is a little tiny dog. It's just weird. It's very strange. The novella is not anywhere near as odd as that. Yeah. Did I answer your question, Steve? It was brilliant. And um, Michael is saying that the Joycians and the, am I saying that right? Joycians? Oh, I reveal how I'm maybe not as much of a lit kid as I should be, uh, are, are thrilled to, to read the forthcoming novel. And as Ted said, it'll be out from Twelve Winters Press later this year or next year. Um, jumping back a little bit to a question from Ona. There's so much anatomy in what you read. Is that a long time interest or something new? And how interesting uh, that you are now saying you're walking and moving body is part of the creative process. Yeah, uh, anatomy. Oh, wow. 
No, I am interested in the literary anatomy. Works like Melville's Moby Dick and uh, Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, that kind of anatomy. But actually, and and um, Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. Uh, so, so I'm I'm going to steer away from questions about uh, the body, maybe. But that literary form, of course, has its origins in the study of the body, uh, and uh, yeah. So. One of the things I wanted to do in the novella was to be as visceral as possible. Like I, I wanted to to capture the physicality and and there's there's a there's a kind of backstory that's explored in the novella about what was the inspiration for the the figure that becomes the dying Albertan, and it seemed it seemed like I wanted to pay or I needed to pay acute attention to the to the body and the way in this case that it was broken. So yeah, I don't have a any more than any other gentle person's interest in anatomy uh, as a field of study, except for the literary anatomy, which comes out of the study of anatomies. Uh, but yeah, for this case, in this case, I, um, yeah, it's of primary interest. Yeah, I must think more about that. Yeah. Well, the other thing I'll say, and Emma knows this about me, Oh, cat. Uh, I, I'm a, a huge fan of sculpture. I, you know, I can't, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm sort of a person that loves to go to a museum and walk among the sculptures and, and look at them from all different angles. So in that sense, uh, yeah, that kind of artistic anatomy too, I'm interested in. Hi, cat. Stop talking. We're on the air. Yeah. Thanks. Um yeah, indeed. I have a question from Rebecca in the chat, and then Grant will go to you after that. Is that all right? Yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, and Jennifer asked um, if the dog at the end of the anchor chain is a shaggy dog, but I think that was more of a, of a rhetorical than a little. Um, but Rebecca's question in the chat, could you say a little more about why the novella appeals to you as a genre? Ah, okay. Yes, indeed. I love the novella. The novella is this in between, I mean, as, as so many folks here know and know better than I do, it's this in between art form. And so where there's a, a sense, you know, some, some folks don't like reading short stories because they want to immerse themselves in a, in, a, in a more sustained diegetic world. And then other people say, well, the one definition and other people say uh, a definition of a novel is it's a long piece of prose that has something wrong with it that's full of problems and so the novella I think is that 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 liminal in-between thing that is has the potential to be kind of perfect I think I'm not I'm not making that claim for, for my own work uh, by any means but the novella it has it has some of the breadth and some of the scope and duration of the novel it has some of the ambition of that form but it has maybe also the crystalline perfection that it aspires to the crystalline perfection that great short stories uh, can achieve. And so, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of novellas and, I, and so I alternate my reading between collections of short stories and novels, but I also read a tremendous amount of novellas. And in fact, uh, I teach a course on the novella and we do one a week. Uh, and so students seem to, to love that. And so, yeah, read Conrad, uh, teach uh, on Dace, uh, I really like, I don't know if Carl's out there, I like Joyce Carol Oates's novellas very well. I think she's one of the few contemporary masters of that form and someone who writes in the novella form uh, an awful lot. Stephen King, I'll also say, is actually pretty good at novellas, right? Like he has those huge blisteringly long, you know, thousand page novels. But I think where he hits sometimes the hardest is when he when he's when he's doing something um, like the body where he's where he kind of reins himself in and, and really moves the story along. So yeah, I I I think the novel novella is a little underappreciated uh, in literary circles. And evidently it's they're hard to publish. The, the way that uh, this novella, The Dying Albertan, was originally published was in how I got to know Ted, was that the 12 Winters ran a contest for the novella because Ted's also a fan uh, of uh, these liminal in-between works. Yeah, so yeah, I love the novella. Yeah, I re yeah, can't wait to read. I can't wait to write another one. Grant, what was your question? 
yeah um brady i was wondering if you might um well i really love the everything you read but especially that last section and um there was a musicality to it so i i you know i was thinking a call and response point counterpoint contrapuntal music going against the grain with what's being said or what the motif was before that so i wonder if maybe you would say a few words about voice and perhaps the how you think of voice maybe with respect to music if you do think of it that way at all oh wow yeah so where's barry to help me out i'm teaching a course on dylan uh, these days i've been talking a lot about voice and the tenor of voice and the timber of voice and how that communicates yeah um, but that's Dylan. Um, one of the modes of writing that most appeals to me is the lyrical, lyrical voice, uh, prose and poetry. And so in that second part, the, the beginning of part two, I really wanted, and again, this is a matter of that tension between being accessible and 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 putting more pressure on the reader so even as i was willing to take the chance in the second part to put more pressure on the reader i i just love that lyrical flow and and uh, try for a kind of lyrical uh, unending sentence the most of what i read the, the of part two is actually just one sentence and so yeah so my inspirations are um faulkner and joyce and that that great uh, lyrical language, and I think, for me, and I don't know if this answers the question, but those are really the most fun parts to read out loud. Like, you know, the, the description of the the statue, the uh, ekphrasis is, you know, it's it's a descriptive, useful, straightforward kind of language. But for me, the real pleasure of language is that the back and forth, and yeah, I don't know if it's if what I'm doing achieves anything musical, but I I was really conscious of how it sounded and trying to the patterns of repeat repeating the words to try to in, in create certain kinds of rhythms and certain kinds of sounds. And I, you know, I'm I'm sadly I'm one of those people that can't pronounce English words with that end in THS. Um, so I have a really hard time saying those out loud, but there's the, some of those uh, sibilant uh, sounds, I uh, was also conscious of trying to pattern into that second part. So I don't know if mine achieves musicality, but I, I certainly wanted that to try to, as much as I could, to achieve a kind of lyrical voice and, um, and to have that stream of consciousness uh, in a lyrical voice in those parts. Yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it to readers and auditors to decide whether it works or is just you know, just stumbling over his words I thought, it was, I thought it was beautiful and you know i was thinking of the dead by joyce you know that 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 amazing ending and um yeah it was very very cool just it's it was musical to me so that's why i wanted to follow up with that question Thanks, man. Uh, folks, a lot of folks, uh, the uh, Illini crowd, the Illinois crowd will know that Grant had a show on uh, WEFT back in the day, rocking the Cornland um, on the spirit of 77 on punk. And he was always kind enough to invite me to sit in as a, uh, so we could talk about punk rock. And so we're talking about music, those are really great music days. And that was, those were such fun times. Yeah. Back in the day. <laughs> Thanks for that, Grant. Another question from Ted. Uh, the book or the collection was without a title until late in the process. Then you found it, a la Emily Dickinson. Could you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, I suppose like a lot of books, uh, this one had a lot of working titles. And when Steve was kind enough to read it and, and talk with me about the stories, and he pointed out the but there's a lot of there's a lot of hardship there's a lot of anguish in these stories and so in that same process I was needing to, to finalize the title and send the manuscript off to Ted to get it started and I was thinking that some of the some of the stories what I was tr trying to get at was how harrowing life can be I mean 
I mean, I'm not, you know, life is great and life is wonderful and there's such pleasures and, and there's music and there's friends and there's books and conversation and, you know, a glass of wine and there's all these great pleasures. But life can also, I mean, you don't need me to tell you, but also be harrowing. And when, when I sort of settled on that word as a term that I would think about to describe some of the stories in this collection, it made me think of this, this most harrowing poem by Emily Dickinson, where she talks about life as, as if you were kind of at sea and there's a tempest over you. And she calls life, the, and so I, I use it as the epigraph for the book, the term between. And so she says, you know, there's this blank space, you, you know, eternity before life, and then this term between, and then eternity afterward. But the term between is harrowing. It's a tempest. And so that's how I decided on the, when I, when I thought of that phrase or that term harrowing, and then that brought to mind the Dickinson. And, but that image stuck with me. I've always been terrified by that poem. Uh, if, you, if you know the one I mean, does anybody know the one I mean, the Emily Dickinson? Yeah, the, that we are this term between, yeah, this these immense blanknesses on either side. I mean, she doesn't see it that way. Um, but yeah, that's where the title came from. Yeah, the tumult, the tempest of the term between our few years. Yeah. But the fun part was we got to push Steve off a cliff. Is Rick still out there? Yeah, we, I, you know, we did what we asked him, right? I mean, Rick will back me up. Steve asked and we... As good friends, we did what we were asked. He definitely made us promise. It was indicated. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it actually all worked out pretty well in the end. <laughs> it's worked, it, it, worked out, out, yeah. it worked out beautifully. I, yeah. I didn't say this in the in the introductions, but um, Steve is recently a granddad, and Ted is, as of just hours ago, a, a granddad. So uh, a re granddad. A re granddad, yes, but uh, has a brand new baby in the world. So it's a it's a celebration of new life too, of, of some more terms between, I suppose you doomed style literary types might say but um we have one more question from steve in the chat that i think is really fitting to close with um if one of the stories could outlive you or would outlive you which one you would which would you wish it to be uh and steve adds the caveat that if you're gonna say the novella he'd push you uh maybe to, to select another okay the novella <laughs> um yeah i'm about uh, to unmute I'm going to unmute. <laughs> okay. Work harder. Yeah. No. Uh, so um, the, the, the truth is my sort of sentimental favorite, uh, and it may, it may be an odd choice, uh, my favorite story in the collection, I mean, I guess they're sort of like kids. Like when you have more than one kid, you're not you're not supposed to say that you like one more than the other. I only you have one have kid. What, you don't have more than one kid. I know. So I only, I only like her. Yeah. But my favorite uh, my favorite story actually in the collection is one called uh, the Pintlers, and it's about um, it's about this police officer, a woman. She's uh, the chief of police in this very small town, Anaconda, Montana, which you may may have heard of. If you're from Montana, you, you know Anaconda. If you're not from uh, Montana, you may still have heard of Anaconda Butte and the mines. Uh, these, are the, these are the Copper King places. And in this story, uh, this police officer is at a fair and, and she has an occasion to meet this, what turns out to be a Cajun couple that have been displaced by Katrina in, in the context of the story, the idea is that the, the storm hit New Orleans so hard, hit Louisiana so hard that this couple was blown all the way to Montana to a mountaintop. And I, it's my favorite story because what I wanted to write was a series of images. I wanted the story, this is a kind of experiment to me. I mean, it's, there's a, a clear narrative, it's a story for sure, but it was, I wanted to build it in a series of very precise images. And some of them, to get back to Ona's point, are, are, are they're about bodies. It begins with the woman tripping, uh, the, the French woman, Jeanette, tripping, falling backwards. And I, I had this series of images. And I wanted to write a surprising story. 
and around these images about about this sort of funny relationship very distant yet interesting one hopefully between this police officer uh, and this couple that clearly loves one another very profoundly uh, these folks who uh, for a time find themselves in Montana yeah so the Pintlers uh, and a place I've done a, a bunch of hiking too of course uh, the Pintler Mountains near Anaconda yeah so if I yeah so if I had to pick a favorite kid uh, yeah it's definitely that story yeah well, fortunately for me, your your only your one and only favorite kid is is, uh, is myself. Um, wonderful. Thank you all for the questions and the discussion, and Dad for sharing your your words and your beautiful craft with us. Um, and Ted for making time to to join us and speak about Twelve Winters and your and your incredibly busy week. I've just resent in the chat the link to Twelve Winters. Um, I would be remiss not to ask you to buy several copies of Dad's uh, collection, and the original <laughs> novella and the novel when it comes out. Um, and I believe Grant is also published with 12 Winters, so some of his stories as well. Uh, and check out the other the other writers. Ted has a, a propensity for picking really interesting authors um, for that press. Um, thanks for that, Amy. Um, and then as I mentioned in conclusion, uh, this is your moment to flee if you hate this, but on Zoom, no one will be able to hear you because Zoom will get really choppy and terrible. But as Steve alluded to, it is my father's birthday tomorrow. He's oh. turning 28 or 32 or some. <laughs> some <laughs> or 72. Yeah, or 72. Uh, rivaling Steve for the oldest of the oldest of the Buffalo Jump brothers. Um, so we, by mandatory uh, daughter facilitation role, I'm gonna ask everybody to unmute. And we will we will stumble through a really painful <laughs> Zoom singing of happy birthday to my dad because there's just nothing else to be done in these trying COVID times other than Zoom happy birthdays. Um, so oh <laughs> happy birthday, Dad. And I also can't really sing, so everyone actually really has to chip in. Okay, are we ready? Well, th thank you all. Thank you all for coming, but don't sing. Stop, let's stop. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. To you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, that went great. <laughs> it's the contract in our future. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, Once in a next lifetime. year, this time we'll have our choral <laughs> rehearsals starting. Um, Happy birthday, Brady. Thank you all for being here. Pick up a copy um, of the of Brady, Brady. term between. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Brady. Good to see you all. Thanks so much, you all. Great reading, Brady. Nice to see Thanks. everybody. Great. Thanks, Brady.